The object of any preventative protection plan is to ensure the safety of responders and the general public from potential harm during an incident. This plan would be implemented only after the isolation perimeter is established and hazard control zones are defined. Tactical options for the protection of employees and the public include public notification, evacuation from the affected area, sheltering in place, or a combination of all the above. It's important to bear in mind that evacuation and sheltering in place are not mutually exclusive options, but are often implemented simultaneously and in conjunction with each other, depending on the situation. There are no absolutes, no black and white criteria, but rather a lot of actions that may evolve as the situation unfolds. In order to effectively utilize evacuation, shelter in place, or a combination of these tools, the local community, fire department, or local emergency planning commission must have conducted pre-planning on the process they will follow in case of a chemical emergency. This includes education of the community on the procedures to follow. This is similar to the planning that schools do to teach the students and teachers what they should do in case of a fire. When considering an evacuation, a number of factors should be evaluated. These include the size and duration of the leak and the practical aspects of moving the affected population. Evacuation of a large segment of population is challenging and poses its own logistic and safety concerns. Evacuation can expose both the public and responders to the hazardous material. When the leak of hazardous material is large, will continue for an extended period of time, or poses the risk of explosion or flashover, it may be necessary to proceed with an evacuation. Planning of the evacuation is critical to its success. Sheltering in place will not totally eliminate the potential for exposure of the general public because over time the contaminated air will enter the building. However, depending upon the structure and precautions taken by the occupants, it can provide protection from significant exposure that may cause injury. The community must be properly trained on shelter-in-place procedures in order for this to be an effective tool. Guidelines should not be viewed as a replacement for the incident commander's view and assessment of the incident scene. The IC's official response plan should take precedence over the protective plan. Once the event has concluded, decontamination of the affected area should be implemented by airing out all buildings, including the shelter-in-place locations, after chlorine has been cleared. Additional information on how to proceed with decontamination of affected areas can be supplied by contacting your chlorine shipper. All emergency responders are familiar with the Emergency Response Guidebook. It provides information to first responders about a large number of chemicals that are transported by truck and rail and could pose a danger to the public if released during an accident. The guides provide emergency responders with valuable information on the potential hazards of the listed chemicals. The actual guides provide information on the health effects, fire and explosion potential, public safety recommendation, emergency response, recommended protective clothing, steps to take for leaks and spills, and immediate first aid for exposure victims. The green pages in the guidebook include initial isolation distances, the information is contained in a table that includes each chemical and the distances to immediately isolate the area around the spill or potential spill and the distances to further protect downwind. These distances are meant to give first responders some guidance as to the degree of danger posed to the public by a leak or spill of the listed chemical. The guidebooks are typically revised every four years. The current version includes a table that provides emergency responders with protect downwind distances for six toxic inhalation hazard, or TIH, chemicals. Chlorine is one of these chemicals. The concern is that the protect downwind distances will be mistakenly considered evacuation distances. This could not be further from the truth. Under certain listed conditions, these protect downwind distances are as much as seven miles. These distances are not evacuation distances. Protect downwind can be achieved in several different ways. According to the extent of the release, no action may need to be taken. Having residents shelter in place is another option. Evacuation can also be considered but should not be the default position. 
A combination of all of these options may be the best solution. In some circumstances, the protect downwind distance in Table 3 is as much as 7 miles. During any incident, much care should be taken to evaluate the amount of the current leak, if any, the potential release, for example, if a rail car is loaded or residue, and the type of facilities in the area. Evacuating ambulatory patients in a hospital or nursing home can do more harm than good. Additional information on sheltering in place can be secured from the National Institute of Chemical Studies, located in Charleston, West Virginia. Recent Department of Homeland Security chemical dispersion tests on chlorine have indicated that even large releases do not follow current dispersion model footprints. Chlorine is two and a half times heavier than air. These tests show that the vapors tend to hug the ground, even moving downhill against wind flow. Responders should review this new data so that topography in the release area is considered as well as wind direction when determining an access route and location of the command center. This training should provide emergency responders information that will not only keep them safe, but will help protect the public as well.